What's up, everybody? I am your host, an evil entity that tries to kill you after fucking, and that is my co-host, a naked old man on a roof. And welcome to the Grindhouse Syndicate, where today we are covering a more recent cult classic and a very highly praised film, David Robert Mitchell's It Follows from 2014. I figured that after the big release of Oz Perkins' Long Legs, which stars Micah Monroe, we should do another uh, Micah Monroe movie. And I don't want to let the cat out of the bag too early here, but I am kind of a big fan of this movie. Yeah, this is, uh, God, I, I think you turned me onto this movie a long, long time ago. About 2016 is when yeah. I've seen it. Yeah, I remember you coming and telling me about this and it was a movie you said I had to watch and I was not disappointed. I will say the way we watch movies now, I seen so much more than I seen then. Agreed. I I remember when I liked it back then, I just liked it for it being different. It was kind of an original thing and it was different, but now I like it for so many more things than I did back then. Yeah, I agree. There's a ton of metaphoric, that's a word, metaphoric things in this movie. A lot of uh, things in the background and the way it was shot that I never picked up on. I would have never picked it up back then. Yeah, you can go back and you can watch this movie just looking at stuff in the background. And there's a, a little bit of, a, there's like some little sprinkles of background story throughout this. And I just never picked up on that back when I watched it before, but I feel like I've got it down mostly at this point. Yeah, I have a I have a theory, and I'm interested to see if you land on that same theory or what you mm. found, or you know, is my theory just obvious to everybody, and I just didn't see it the first time I watched it. So I'm really interested to see how this goes. Yeah. Before we jump into It Follows, though, the teaser trailer for Terrifier 3 is out. This came out mere days ago. It looks amazing. He makes a fucking snow angel out of blood, which I couldn't ask for much more than that. <laughs> that, that is the best part of the trailer. When he sits his ass down in that blood and you're like, Oh, what the fuck is he going to do? And then he starts making a fucking snow angel in the blood. It is like, that is the most Ark the Clown fucking thing. You maybe know, ever. You know, it's funny is when I first watched it, I didn't even realize that there was blood on the floor. I thought it was just like a red floor. And he sits down and I'm like, what's he doing? And then he lays down and starts making a snow angel. And this is when I realized like, this is, and I, I see the leg on the floor. And I'm just like, oh, oh, wow. Like, this is this is going to be this is going to be wild and i've heard many times now that for one the opening kill is supposed to be fantastic but i also keep hearing that it is like it is like a kid and some people are kind of freaking out about this and i was like well you know it is art the clown <laughs> so, yeah this is the benefit of not going through a major studio and making your own movie you can kill whoever the fuck you want to kill yeah and people got to People got to deal with it. Yeah, yeah it's I, a movie. You know, it's no one would want to watch this and like really happen, but it, it's just a movie and it's a terrifier movie at that. So, well, you know, I, I've made this point a million times on the show, but any, any horror movie, really any movie in general, but for, for me, especially horror movies that can make you feel something, even if it's like disgust and killing a kid. That's a movie that did its job. A movie that can make you forget that you're watching a movie and make you actually feel something and for a second forget that these are actors. That, that's that's a, a job well done. Yeah, we talked about that actually the other night when you guys finally watched um, Stop Motion and Brooke was like, oh, it, that, made, that made me feel gross. Like, I didn't like it. And I said, that's what's awesome about it. Like, it does make you feel... Like, it just keeps getting worse and worse, and I'm like, that's what I love about the movie. Yeah, that is a, a creep show. Like, that whole, that whole fucking thing is creepy as fuck, and, but that's what makes that movie great, and 
I don't think she's big on slow burns. That is a slow burn, but but a really creepy, like it just it just there's so many parts of that movie that just gross you out. That that is the underlying horror that they go with in that movie, and I think they did it great. Yeah, I will continue to push for stop motion. If you have not seen it, watch it. I love it. Also, I don't know if you know this, but they just announced in a violent nature too. Nice. Working on a sequel. You know, I'm I'm big on that. I yeah. thought that that's and me personally. I'm pretty sure I had that as the highest rated movie of the year so far. Wow, uh, close! It's, it, it, it's a close head to head with with Late Night with the Devil. But man, that movie, you know, I would ne- I wouldn't want to watch every movie like that. And I get why some people didn't like it, especially if you don't like a slow burn. But that movie just did something that has never been done before. And they did it in such a beautiful, like it's such a beautiful movie, but it's so gruesome at the same time. I I think it's just something we had never seen before. Yeah. Now that we're, we're over halfway through the year. And uh, for those of you who didn't listen to us back in the previous year, we always do at the end of the year, we do kind of a, a, our own top 10 list and we don't tell each other our top 10 list throughout the whole entire year. And we kind of go through it with each other in an episode where we kind of just do the best of the year. And now that we're over halfway through, I'm really getting excited to see where these movies are going to land because I, I know that I, I, at least the top three to five movies for us are going to be in different orders. Yeah, and and I'll, you know, I had no problem saying that's one of the top rated movies because that we've done, we've done episodes, uh, review episodes on almost all the major, major movies that's come out. So you've kind of got an idea of what my initial ratings were. Now those top movies I will watch again when we do the rating. Because I remember specifically Late Night with the Devil actually went up in ratings after we did the review and then we did the full episode on it. So there'll be some fine tuning in there. Uh, some of them might go down a little bit. Some of them might go up. But as of right now, my first impressions on In a Violent Nature was amazing. Yeah, I always try to because we get a little bit of a break around the Christmas time area. And I always use that time to go back and watch like my top five movies and kind of, you know, if I need to adjust things or retweak things, the list, that's when I'll do it. So that, that movie, you know, and, and like the movie you brought up after like, or, or before that with, with Terrifier, those movies are both like gore slashers. Like you have to be into practical effects to really enjoy those movies. But they are complete opposite on the spectrum. Yeah. One is a fast, insane, and one of them is a very slow burn, artsy type movie. And they, I think they're they're both great at what they do. But I, I thought it was really interesting how, you know, they're both the same type of movie, but they're completely different. We still have two really big heavy hitters, in my opinion, coming. We have we have Terrifier. That's gonna kind of. Possibly these two movies could wrecking ball our list, you know, at least our top five that we have right now, which is, you know, Terrifier 3. And then we got Robert Eggers, who did The Witch, his Nosferatu that's coming out. So and they have let very little bit about that movie come out. We did get that little bit of a a teaser trailer, but they wouldn't show us the vampire. So, yeah, I mean, and that doesn't come out until December. So it's it's still coming together. Still some big ones. We had the trailer for Alien too. Uh, Alien looks good. The the cinematographer who we did the episode of, of Gretel and Hansel on. Yeah. It's one of my opinion, the one of the most beautiful movies I'd ever seen. And the director of Evil Dead. Yeah. The, the not not the OG Evil Dead, but the remake. Remake Evil Dead. Yeah, uh, I'm not big on on sci-fi space movies, but if you haven't seen the trailer for that and you are a sci-fi space horror fan, definitely check that out because from what you could see, it is a a beautifully shot movie. Uh, All right, so let's talk about 
it followed. Are, are we bringing back the news? Did that? No, just happen? there was just did, so did we many... do a shout out to the the old news days. Yeah, there was just some things that I just I just needed to talk about. Just needed needed to happen. You had to get them out. Yeah. But first, if you want to stay up to date on what is going on with us or the show, talk about or submit your movie request, or just say hey, you can always find us at one of our social media accounts or our official website at GrindhouseHorrorPod.com. Facebook at the Grindhouse Syndicate Horror Podcast, Instagram at GrindhouseSyndicate.Horror.Pod, and many more which you can find links for in the show notes as always. And please subscribe or follow for alerts on new episodes. And if you really love us and don't want us to be stalked by an invisible lady with her tit out, give us a review. Please give us a review. I don't want to <laughs> okay. see a tit out. <laughs> it Follows is a 2014 American horror film written and directed by David Robert Mitchell. It stars Micah Monroe as a young woman who is pursued by a supernatural entity after a sexual encounter. It debuted at the 2014 Cannes Film Festival and was later purchased by Radius TWC for distribution. After a successful limited release, the film had a wide release two weeks later on March 27th of 2015. It Follows received acclaim from critics who praised it for its originality and performances. It grossed $23.3 million worldwide against a $1.3 million budget. It has since achieved a cult following with many calling it a modern horror classic and one of the best horror films of the 2010s. In October of 2023, a sequel entitled They Follow was announced to be in development with filming due to begin in 2025. Writer and director David Robert Mitchell conceived the film based on a recurring dream he had about in his youth about being followed. The film was shot in late 2013 in Detroit, Michigan. Mitchell used wide-angle lenses when filming to give the film an expansive look and cited the works of George A. Romero and John Carpenter as influences on the film's compositions and visual aesthetic. The score was composed by Rich Veerland, better known as Disasterpiece. The digital version of the soundtrack for the album went on sale March 10th of the same year. Following the film's success, Radius TWC co-president Tom Quinn announced that the studio was looking into a possible sequel. Quinn has expressed the idea of flipping the concept of the first film around with Jay or another protagonist going down the chain to find the origin of it. On October 30th of 2023, it was announced that a sequel entitled They Follow was in pre-production with writer-director David Robert Mitchell and star Micah Monroe returning. Neon, Quinn's second film studio, would produce and distribute the film domestically and filming would begin in 2025. Hmm, That's exciting. I, I had no idea that was going on. Yeah, I came and I'm told you. I'm pretty sure the day you they told me that. that. Yeah, <laughs> but you, you know, I'm gonna be honest. You know, I'm bad with names. <laughs> you know, I'm awful with names. Yeah, they follow. I'm. I wonder how they're gonna do that. Are they well, still sticking to the kind of finding the origin, like going down the line? Because that would. I don't be, know. That would be really cool. I don't know how they would do that. The the same people writing it. Yeah, same guy. Same yeah. writer and director. The. What I took from this movie and some of the things that I picked up on, this movie is is one of the rare movies where almost every scene is important or somehow points towards the metaphor or symbolism or something. Like everything has meaning behind it. I would I would put this up with one I mean, I would call this a masterpiece. I would. Mm. As as far as well, as, I know I know your rating is going to be good at the end of the episode. Well, well, no, my my rating's not like a, a a near perfect rating or anything like that. But as far as the the thought behind the movie and the cinematography and everything that went into that, it's such a well thought out movie that I trust them with being able to track an origin and it makes sense. Well. I, you know, I didn't know when we were going to get into it, but we'll, we'll get into it now. I 
don't know if I want there to be a sequel to this. I'm worried about that. Well, you know, when you specifically mentioned them tracking back to an origin, the reason I said that is I wouldn't trust many writers with that because there's so many ways you can fuck this up based off of what the first movie meant. And, you know, it, it, I think it would be tough. But, I'd, I, you know, the guy who wrote the original is writing the, the sequel. I'll put my trust in him. Uh, you know, I'm going to hold back my thoughts about the sequel until later because, because everything that I'm going to say about this film later on is going to come out and, you know, what I am going to say about the up and coming sequel. But I will just leave it right now with I'm on the fence if I want a sequel. But we'll, we'll, we'll get into that later. So the ratings. This is kind of all over the place. I'll tell you now. So Rotten Tomatoes. Oh, I know they gave it a good rating. Ninety five percent. Yeah, I was about to this is this is a artsy, one of those very just like I said with cinematography. Yeah, this is up there alley. And the, the symbolism and everything, it's definitely up there alley. IMDB, it's got a six point eight out of ten. So, you know, okay. Yeah, that's, okay. that's an okay movie. Letterboxd is a three point five out of five. That's a seven out of ten. That's around the okay yeah. movie too. Now here's where it gets surprising. The Google average audience rating is a two point eight out of five. Yeah, that is surprising. I didn't think it would be that low. I didn't. Either. I didn't think it would be all that high because I don't think a lot of people watch movies as intently. I I didn't until we did the show. I mean, like as far as symbolism and cinematography and stuff. I, I learned a lot of that when we started doing this and really learned what to look for. The first time I watched this movie, I, would, I wouldn't have rated it uh, down low like that, but I, it wasn't rated as high as I have it now. Yeah, I, I was surprised because, you know, I don't, really, I don't really know if I've ever heard anybody, you know, say much negative stuff about this movie. This is typically... Kind of, I would say most people would at least give it a 3.5. Yeah, I would agree with that. And to see it as a 2.8 was really surprising. I think when I first seen it, the first first watch, it probably would have been somewhere between a 3.7 and 3.9. Mm. So uh, close. If you would like to watch this movie, you can currently find it streaming on Netflix and Amazon Prime. And, of course, you can probably rent it at just about any streaming service. All right, so the plot. Let's plot. So we start off with a shot of a pretty typical middle-class neighborhood in Detroit, Michigan. And as we pan to the front of the house, we see a teenage girl come running out of the front door. She then runs into the middle of the street where she turns around looking for whatever is chasing her. She then begins to slowly walk backwards when we hear her dad ask her what is going on. She responds that she is fine before taking off running back towards the house. After heading inside for a moment, we see her bolt out of the door again, this time heading for her car in the driveway. We then cut to her just sitting on the beach alone in the dark, and you can tell that she is very troubled about something. While sitting there, we hear her phone ring, and when she answers it, we find out that it is her dad who is very worried after seeing her quickly leave the home. While speaking to him, she has a very trembly voice, like pretty much like she's like about to cry. She then tells her father that she wants her mother and him to know how much she loves them. She then starts apologizing for being difficult sometimes. So she's pretty much saying what sounds like her last goodbyes here. Once the call ends, the screen goes black and we cut to the morning at the beach. And this is where we see her dead body laying in the sand, bent in a very unnatural position. She took break a leg very serious for this part. So we see her right leg like sticking up and it's like broken in two. Like like her way. Yeah, her knee has been snapped the opposite direction. And it's like ripped open with like bone and stuff sticking out there's like a ton of blood it looks like the hulk snapped her leg in two like backwards i put in here it looked like she fell from like a hundred stories like straight to her legs like it's rough 
Uh, we then jump on over to another house where we meet our main character, Jay, a 19-year-old girl who lives in a pretty average middle-class neighborhood. We then meet Jay's sister, Kelly, as she informs Jay that their friends Paul and Yara just arrived and asked if she would like to watch a movie with them. She declines, telling Kelly that she is about to go out on a date with a new guy and she needs to get ready. We then cut to the living room where Kelly, Yara, and Paul are watching the oldest fucking movie ever on TV. And what is the deal with the fucking shell phone? I thought that was fucking hilarious. Um, the shell phone? The shell phone, yeah. The shell phone's cool. No, no but I, I, I know why they did that. Well, I have an idea of why they did that. And it kind of ties into the metaphor, but I'll, I'll, I'll just, without going too deep into it, this movie doesn't take place at a specific time. Yeah. And that's why they you'll see like old ass TVs, old movies, newer cars, and then the the phone is obviously like futuristic. And that kind of goes into the metaphor. This this is something God, how do I not how do I not get that away? Well, Th- this is this is not specific to one time period. No, this no. Is, this, this, this could happen anytime. It's happened in the past. It'll happen in the future, and it's happening obviously in the present. Yeah. So, according to the guy who wrote and directed it, the reason that he did that is because, and I think this is one of the genius parts about this movie, is it's supposed to be dreamlike. You know, where you have a dream and. The sum of the stuff in the dream just doesn't make sense. That is what this movie does. And I think that it's it's so great because, you know, I never really realized that about dreams until I read him talking about talking about doing this. And I this is this is one reason why I originally watched the movie back in like 2016 is because I heard that. And I thought, man, that's a that's a great point. Because How many times in like your dream where, you know, whatever setting you're in, you walk out of one room and into another room and they're like two in real life, they'd be two completely different places. And some of the stuff is just not what would realistically you would have in your room or your house. It's different. I thought you were about to tell me you never noticed that about dreams until just now. Oh, no, no, no. He was like, years ago. in this episode, <laughs> no, and I was like, ago. damn. No. <laughs> My dreams must be really fucking weird then. Well, you know, it's <laughs> it's funny because it, it means like a lot more now because, um, you know, once I came back from my deployment, I would have these dreams about Iraq. And I was telling my doctor, you know, years ago that I would dream situations about people that weren't there you know, or things that didn't happen. They were always slightly different, slightly weird. But the only thing that was like the same was me and the place I was at. And the, it just, it just like kind of clicks with me more because of, of that. Mine's always like the places like it. I'll be in like a house that, that my brain has crafted perfectly. Like I've lived there, but it's not a house. That matter of fact, last night I had a nightmare. I rarely ever have nightmares. And it was a house that we all lived in, and I have no idea what house it was. Yeah. And no fucking clue. Maybe it just took some elements from other houses and somewhere in my memory bay and stuck them together. But, yeah, as far as the shell phone, I thought, you know, they, they kind of add some, some more present stuff, and I thought that was kind of a something that was more futuristic. And I thought shell phone, like, that's just funny. Yeah, like it's it, a shell phone. Yeah, it, it's <laughs> it's cool. Um, I've looked into it before in the past, and the special effects guy actually just made it. It's it doesn't. It's not something that exists because a lot of people try to look it up on the internet to buy one. It doesn't exist. It's basically, if you don't know, it is a phone, a Kindle, inside of like one of those the makeup things that that girls carry around. I don't know what makeup it would be, but. It's just um, a shell. A little it's comp- like a fucking yeah, little shell that closes. or whatever. It's like a, sh- a flip phone designed to be like a shell. Yeah, and, you know, in this movie, uh, Yara, who, who has it, she basically reads a book off of it the whole entire time. But, yeah, also, right off the bat here, just how Paul says, hey, when Jay walks in, he's, he's got a big crush. Yeah. I mean, that's a, a very, very noticeable. Yeah, this dude is like... 
He he would literally implant himself in her ass if he could. Yeah. Like this guy is is all about Jay for sure. Yeah, you know, in the beginning of the movie he really gives off like future simp vibes. He like feels he's friend zoned. He's that oh, he's yeah, that friend zoned yeah. guy who's just too nice. He's like, Jay, do you need me to moderate your Discord for you for free? Yeah. So we then see Jay get ready for her date, where we then cut to her and this guy named Hugh standing in line at a movie theater. While waiting, they end up playing this game where one person has to pick someone in the crowd that they want to trade places with, and the other one has to guess who it is. Hugh then picks the girl in the yellow dress, but Jay is confused because she doesn't see her. Hugh then tries to point her out, but when Jay looks, there is no one there. Once she tells him that she can't see anyone, Hugh's whole attitude changes and he immediately wants to leave the theater. They then rush to Hugh's car where Jay tries to ask why he wanted to leave so bad and he tells her a very obvious lie and that he just felt sick and he you know, feels better outside. They then go to eat at a restaurant where everything seems to go great. They seem to really like each other and are planning to go out again. We then cut to their next date where we see Hugh and Jay making out by the water when suddenly Jay says the magic words, let's go back to the car. We then see them in the backseat doing some slow, sensual sex and it doesn't seem like Hugh uh, lasted very long. It's pretty yeah. quick there. Well, I mean, in his situation, knowing what I know now, yeah. I'd be trying to get that shit done quick too. I uh, feel like that would make me more nervous than I <laughs> I would wonder like, well, do I got to finish for the curse to pass or do I just got to get it in there? Yeah. Like what, what counts? I don't know. Uh, he's, he's, he's got to, he's got to put a whole load in her. Yeah. <laughs> um, so afterwards we see Hugh get out of the car and go to the trunk as Jay lays down in the back, bathing in the afterglow of getting some new penis. What a weird place to park the fuck though. Like they're literally in the middle of this, a, uh, abandoned building parking lot but they didn't even they're not in a parking spot or anything they're just in the one spot that happens to be lit up like you didn't even park in the shadows or anything it's just like yeah. we got a little bit of light here let's park in the middle of the road well probably because he needed <laughs> to like watch out for the for the thing you know he needs to be able to see ah, that, that that is a good point i i would be if I was her, though, I'd be like, hey, what, you know, maybe we should, maybe we should park over there in the shadow over there in case, yeah, like, some police roll through here or something. She then begins telling him about this dream that she used to have about going on dates with this cute guy. When we then see Hugh get in the back seat behind Jay and place a rag of chloroform over her face. I think the, what she is talking about right before this happens, I think is, ends up being kind of a hint to what I see as the metaphor of the movie, but I think it, uh, and I'll reference it later towards the end, but uh, what she's saying right here has has some meaning behind it. Mm. And, and essentially what she's talking about is, in a very quick summary of, she's talking about, you know, she used to have a dream when she was a kid about being an adult and just getting in a car and she had no idea where they were going. And it was just this amazing feeling of freedom. And now that they're adults, it's like, where the fuck do we even go? And then, you know, he, she's, she gets chloroformed. So. Yeah. Uh, so Jay passes out. And when she wakes up, she finds herself in an abandoned building restrained to a wheelchair. Hugh then walks over and tells her that he doesn't plan on hurting her, but he needs to explain something that's hard to believe, but is very important. But basically, he tells her that even though she probably won't believe him, it is very important for her to remember everything he says. So, here is the deal. So, he slept with someone a, I don't know, week or so ago. He doesn't really say. And they passed him this, like, curse. And in order to pass it on to someone else and save yourself, you have to go find someone to basically fuck. And then after that, you're you're pretty much free and clear, but it is up to the the other person to find somebody else to pass it on to. So it's like a the chain letter curse. They used to get you know the emails and stuff. If you don't pass this on to ten people or whatever, thank God yeah, you don't was, have to fuck I was ten people. <laughs> say like an STD, but 
No. Oh, yeah, yeah. Well, no, the STD, mm-hmm. like, you don't pass the STD on to someone else, and then you're good. And boy, that that's <laughs> true. Yeah, I but mean, But only if it works true. like that. <laughs> this poor girl, like, she, she done got fucked for the first time, immediately chloroformed, tied up, and then told that she he cheated on her and in, in that he gave her an std demon well this isn't her this isn't her first time this this did they specifically mention that in here that's yeah, not they her do first time. she uh later on in the movie she actually talks about one of the reasons she got craig to do what she got him to do is because they hooked up in high school before and it wasn't a big deal i mean she's in college mm. at this point so yeah it, this is her first time with this guy though well it seemed like she she had Built this up for a little while before she had let him hook up. I know they've been dating at least at this point because I know she's got a picture of them two together. Yeah, that would be awful. Oh, yeah. The, the, like, yeah, I cheated on you and gave you an, an STD demon. Yeah, that's, that's pretty, pretty much trying to is. kill you. So basically, until you pass this on, this thing is always after you. It can look like someone you know, it could look like a stranger. Pretty much anybody, alive, dead, doesn't matter. And it also, it never runs. It always just walks. And if you let it get too close, you will end up like the girl on the beach. Also, only cursed people can see it. So at this point, you know, only him and Jay would be able to see it. Because even though, like, he passed it to her... You know, he, you can still see it until she passes it to someone else. It's one being, and he said it's very slow, but be careful. It's really smart. Yeah. And it can essentially shapeshift into anybody it wants to. So you may get away for a little while, but it uses very slick ways to get close to you. Yeah. So now that we know all this, this is, you know, makes more sense of Hugh's reaction in the movie theater. So... That kind of clears clears that up. He also says, "Might say later on, if it touches her, it'll kill her." And so we kind of learn by that when she watched the movie that this none of this is set in stone. This is just what he was told. This is just what he yeah. knows. Yeah, yeah. There's no book or anything, which makes sense of why he would tell her like, "If it touches you, it'll kill you," because that be the easiest way to tell somebody don't let this fucking thing get anywhere near you because if they die then the, this thing's gonna come back after you yeah it sucks because the rules of this are kind of passed down like the game of telephone and yeah. you know that things get fucked up when you know when when you pass information like that i think it, it's kind of an important part of the movie because when you watch this for the first time you think those are the rules like you just assume that those are the, the for sure rules and it ends up not being the case later on. It's it's pretty close, but yeah, there are some yeah, there's some slight some, difference. Some things that messes he messed up, and you realize well, all all he knows is what this girl at the bar that passed this to him told him. Uh, so while he is telling her this, he spots this thing and wheels Jay's wheelchair over to see it. And when she looks down from the building, she sees a butt ass naked middle aged woman slowly walking towards them. He then pulls the chair back and tells her, in order to get rid of it, just sleep with someone as soon as you can. And if it manages to kill her, then the curse will go back to him. As the naked lady slowly walks closer, Q takes Jay to his car and then quickly speeds off from the abandoned building. So then we see Kelly, Yara, and Paul sitting on the porch playing cards when suddenly Hugh's car pulls up like he's about to do a drive-by. He jumps out and dumps Jay in the middle of the street in her underwear, still tied up. That's a pretty fucking bold move. I didn't think she was still tied up, but her she hands was like are. falling over and stuff. And my first thought was, well, you know, nothing really happened. Like he didn't beat her or anything. Like she almost looks like she got assaulted. Yeah. And, but, but then I thought about it and I'm like, well, she's probably still pretty fucked up from being chloroformed and. He may have chloroformed her again before he took her home, but she's definitely flustered. Yeah, her her hands are tied, but her legs aren't. And I guess he did that so she didn't, like, you know, try to attack him or something while he was driving. But So they do the realistic thing and actually call the cops. Jay tells them the story of what happened. She ends up going to the hospital for tests, and a few days later, the cops inform them that 
Hugh used a fake name to rent a house in the city, and by the time they checked it out, he had fled. So they have no idea who this guy really is or where the fuck he's at. I would say, man, this guy came up with quite the plan here. Like, how long did he have, like, the thing following him where he, like, rented a house? Well, they've been dating. So I think he's been building this up. Like, it, I don't think it ever says exactly how long they've been dating. But her her sister asked her in the beginning, like, how things are going with them. And she's, well, she, like, pretty good. Well, she doesn't even know his name. She just called yeah. him the new guy. So I don't think they've been dating too long. But, yeah, I mean, he rented a whole fucking house with a fake name. Well, yeah, he, he uh, I don't know. Maybe he's plan. tried to pass this on before. Yeah, maybe. And he does make the point, though, later on in the movie that it's easier for her. She's a female. As being a male and being desperate to get this demon off of your back, it would probably, it would take some planning. So we then see a very depressed Jay standing in the bathroom having a panic attack while looking at her vajayjay. <laughs> She's like, look what you fucking got us into. Yeah, yeah. When suddenly a ball hits the window, she checks it out but doesn't really see anything except for the ball in the grass. The camera then switches to an outside shot of the house showing the neighbor kid hiding under the window. What a little bastard. He's sitting there fucking spying on her while she's in her underwear in the bathroom. Yeah. Little fucker. The the same kids that were spying on her at the pool, right? Yep. Like, damn, you kids ain't got no fucking binoculars or a better hiding spot than that. That's awful. So sometime later, Jay is sitting in class. It looks like she's in like a community college. And we keep getting shown this neighbor guy who is around the same age as Jay. And we've seen a couple quick glimpses of him probably like i don't know like three maybe four times so far but we do not know who he is yet but he is kind of checking jay out throughout this class when he then sees jay staring out of the window and at first it's pretty normal just a couple of students sitting in the grass reading books when she then sees a very old lady in a nightgown walking across the field in her direction This lady has no expression on her face, and all of the people that she walks past have zero reaction to her. Jay gets freaked out as the old lady gets closer, and once she is right outside of the window to the classroom, Jay decides that she has had enough of higher education today and takes off. And as she is walking quickly through the hallways, we can see the old lady is slowly walking behind her. She turns around and says hello, but the old lady doesn't answer. And it is at this point that Jay has realized that Hugh was telling her the truth about the sex curse. Jay then heads to the ice cream shop where Kelly and Paul are working. She then tells them uh, what Hugh said about the thing following her. Kelly says that this is all bullshit and that she should tell their mom. But Jay refuses and Creeper Paul then offers to stay the night to, I guess, protect her. Yeah. Is it, he just found out she's got an ST demon, and like <laughs> literally, demon. he's still like, I'll, I'll stay the night. I'll yeah. guard you. All 115 pounds of me, I'll guard you. Jay agrees to let Paul sleep on the couch, where he then professes that he's going to stay up all night and keep an eye out for anything weird. Like That's you, weird. That's you, weird in itself. You can't fight sleep, Paul. You're too weak. Somebody like you needs to train for such trials. So later that night, we see that Yara and Paul have both decided to stay the night. Everyone goes to bed with Paul watching TV on the couch. Jay is having problems sleeping when she comes down to the living room to talk to Paul. And while they are reminiscing about their childhood, we hear a glass break in another room. Paul goes to check it out and when he returns, he tells her that there is a broken window in the kitchen but no one is there. This obviously freaks Jay out when Paul then runs upstairs to wake up Kelly and Yara. While Paul is gone, Jay goes to look at the window and as she slowly walks into the kitchen, she turns the corner and boom. She sees a pretty rough looking middle-aged woman with a skirt and bra on, her left boob hanging out, and one tube sock on slowly walking in her direction. Now, this is a beautifully shot scene, in my opinion. It's the boob, isn't it? It, It's the boob. boob. 
they do such a good job with the suspense here. And I, this is when I noticed how important the soundtrack was to this movie, because I think that this movie would, it would be good, but it wouldn't be as good with the soundtrack. Actually, so I picked that up when it really stood out to me is in the beginning before she's going out on the date, she's putting on her makeup in the mirror and there's this really like just odd music playing in the back. And it really gives you the kind of the sense of kind of how this movie is going to go. And one thing about that scene and the hanging out scenes and some of the background uh, score that they've had in the, the back. One thing they do really good with this movie is they show like real life, like how like mundane it is, you know, in movies, a lot of times, you know, they're hanging out, laughing and joking. Everything's good. This is more like realistic. Oh, yeah. Some later teenagers sitting there like nobody's really talking. One of them's playing on their phone. They're watching something. But the score always does a really good job of highlighting that. Well, one thing with the score, and this this is going to play into the cinematography as well. There was something kind of familiar about the score to me. Always has been. I just never knew what it was. And then I read an interview where the writer-director talks about how he really... Because you, you notice this movie has a ton of tracking shots. Cameras just moving. And he said that he did that to pay homage to The Shining. And then when you kind of put how the score and the tracking shots went together with The Shining, it's very similar to this movie. Hmm. Yeah. And it has that, that, like, you know, quiet, eerie when something's happening, like The Shining, and then you get this sudden, loud, like, shrieking violins or something that happened. Yeah. that That is, in my opinion, it kind of goes kind of hand in hand with how The Shining used their tracking shots and their their soundtrack to create the suspense to make you feel something like feel this dread and then sudden suspense yeah. e- even before the suspense parts in both of those movies this movie and the shining the way that the score is done it's so creepy that even though like nothing weird is happening on screen yet you just get the feeling that something is off yeah and then with with this scene, with the uh, the the one boob out girl pissing herself is is so f- fucking creepy. Like this scene was so creepy. This is one of the creepiest like demons that I th- I think take shape just because it's so. There's just something inher- inherently creepy about the the shape it takes here, and that's one thing that this movie does a really good job of is it always takes the shape of a person, but there's always just something off about the person. No, I think that this scene is, it really reminds me a lot of when Jack in The Shining goes to room and the old lady is coming out of the, the bathroom, dripping wet, and it's slow motion like that with the soundtrack, like, and he's just standing there. And this is like a very similar scene to that. Yeah, and that that's a, super creepy scene too i i think so so like the the most common fear amongst people is the fear of the unknown like that is the most common fear that everybody has you know we have it we've developed it through evolution to help our survival and that's not just people that's i'm pretty sure any mammals this movie does a really good job at playing on the fear of the unknown because they know very little about this demon, and it always takes the shape of something. It's always a person, but it always has something just inherently creepy and off. There's always just something yeah, it, off about it's the like shapes it, that it takes. It's like it doesn't almost know how to pretend to be a person, like a hundred percent. Exactly. Like it. it I mean, it, you can tell even with the, the walking. Sh- yeah, it, it takes, doesn't walk like a person. Yeah, it takes the shape of a person, but I think it's a good way to put it. Like it doesn't know how to emulate a person because this is this is not a person or a being that was ever a person. This is something very different. Yeah. All right. So as the lady walks towards her, we get a close-up shot of her legs, and she is just pissing all over herself. 
Jay freaks out and runs to her room and locks the door. Paul and Kelly attempt to get in and after some reassuring, Jay lets them into the room. While inside talking, the door handle begins to move. It ends up just being Yara wondering like what the fuck is going on. I feel like Yara is always like, what's going on? Yeah, I didn't, she, even, I didn't even know Yara was there at this point. I, I kind of forget about her throughout the movie. But she always has this, like, she's always, like, kind of stoned or something. She, she's hiding all her weed in that shell phone. In that shell phone. Yeah, she's wondering what's going on. They then open the door to reveal Yara just standing there confused. And just when Jay thinks it's safe, a fucking eight-foot-tall creepy pale guy in a dirty white t-shirt comes walking up behind Yara in the hallway. This is a great, this is a great shot. Yeah. Creepy. Very creepy. In real life, I think this guy's like 7'7 or something. Like he is, so he is too tall. He is is too too tall. tall. He has a twin brother and they are the tallest twins in the world. Mm. Yeah. Uh, Jay freaks out and takes off out of her sliding glass door grabs a bicycle and rides off down the street. She ends up at a neighborhood park where Paul, Kelly, and Yara find her sitting on a swing. While trying to reassure Jay, we see that this neighbor dude from the classroom walk up wondering what is going on. So it turns out that this guy's name is Greg, and I didn't trust him the moment I fucking seen him. Yeah, he he gives off bad vibes for sure. He has, like, he, he gives off vibes, like, he's that guy. That you buy weed off of. And when you get home, you realize it's short. And then he doesn't answer the phone. Yeah, it's like, it's, it's like a, or it's like super seedy or fucking all shake or oregano. Back back in the days of mids, I, I know anybody young listening to this don't know about that. But yeah, he's the shady guy, man. Oh, for he's, sure. You, you, you can tell there's something off about this guy. Uh, but anyway, he plays the compassionate and caring card with Jay. And she says that she doesn't want to go home, that she really just needs to find Hugh to ask him about what is following her. And Greg agrees and goes to get his car. So Greg, Kelly, Paul, and Yara, and damn, that's a lot of people. So Greg, Kelly, Paul, Yara, and Jay find the house that Hugh was renting. Turns out it is a piece of shit in a very rundown neighborhood. Maybe that's how he rented the house in like a fake name. Like whoever just rented it was like, just give me money. Give me money and you can stay there. I don't care. It's like actually abandoned. Yeah. The guy who like rented it to him is just some crackhead trying to get <laughs> money. A squatter. So they break in and don't really find much. The place is pretty empty except for a bunch of trash. We do see that Hugh had the place like set up where he could hear something trying to get in. Paul finds a dirty mattress where Hugh slept on the top floor where next to it lay some old porno mags and a bunch of tissues. Well, Paul flips mm. through the books, which, by the way, I would have never fucking touched those books. You got to get through the sticky pages first. That's a job for Paul, not for me. I wouldn't fucking touch them books at all. Ugh. Paul will go to any lengths to help <laughs> Jay out. He would. He will flip through those sticky pages with his mouth if he had to. Yes, he would. <laughs> But when it comes to dried up bodily fluids, Paul's braver than I because he opens them up without a second thought and finds a picture of Hugh and his girlfriend in a local high school. So next we see Greg and Jay head to the school where an administrator pulls out a yearbook and looks up Hugh's real name, which is Jeff Rudman. I gotta say, this was a good call on Paul with the school jacket. That was good. He's, he's, he's really trying. He's made, yeah. He maybe scored a couple points there. He cracked the case. I think it's weird that this guy was keeping a picture of him and his old girlfriend in, in his Playboys. Well, it was this, yeah, that was his porn stash, and he's just reminiscing about the high school Yeah, days. but he's like an adult, and they were probably like 15. He's like masturbating to some 15-year-old girl he dated fucking five years ago. Maybe it's better than those 1970 porno mags he had. I'll take the mags. By the way, did you happen to see the thing following them into the school? No. Oh, yeah. Didn't okay. see that. So you first see her at the timestamp is 4922. And she is wearing a white sweater and blue jeans with a backpack. And so... 
the first shot you get, she literally like walks out of like a wall of the school, like literally where she comes from or where it comes from would not make sense for a human being to walk from. It's literally just a brick wall. And then you see it again after Jay and Greg walk into the lobby. You know when the camera spins? Like they, they walk in and the camera does this 360. Yeah, that, they do a lot of this in this movie. But so yeah. the it, it's there too. And it's the same, you know, white sweater, blue jeans, backpack, walking, getting ready to walk into the school. And then you see it one last time when Greg and Jay get into the car after finding out Hugh Jeff's real name, right before they pull off when they're telling the others in the back the name, here it comes, it, walking right up to the car. Yeah, I didn't notice that. That's pretty cool. Yeah. And that goes back to, you know, what Hugh initially said. You know, it, it's slow. It moves slow, but it's very smart. And it'll find ways to to take shapes to get around you. Yeah, Um. It you know you you literally it almost gets them like three different times at this school and none of the characters realize this. Yeah. So Jay decides not to inform the police, but instead looks up Hugh Jeff's house so she can ask him what the fuck is going on. That was weird when they when they're talking to the person, the lady that works at the school, to find out who who this guy is. One thing you notice in this movie, and I think there's a reason they did it, but. You never quite see the adults. Like, most of the adults are always shot from the back. They, they never show their faces. And I think that kind of plays into the fear of you kind of not knowing where this thing is or who it is. It could be anybody. I, I also think there's another big reason that kind of ties into what I think the, the main metaphor of the movie was. But yeah, it's just creepy. Like, they do show a couple of the, a couple of the adults' faces. But but it's always from far away. A lot of times you'll hear them talking, but you'll you'll see them talking, but you can't hear what they're saying. They kind of isolate the parents and the adults in this movie. Yeah, I personally think that this goes back to the dream thing because if you think back to your dreams, you you can remember the face of the per the people you're interacting with, but you don't ever remember the physical details of the people in the background of the dream. And I think that that is what this is representing because the whole, the whole story is written like a dream. And I think that, you know, a lot of shows and movies try to do the dream sequences and all this stuff. I think this is the best that you could do it. I think this is the, the closest to a dream. But uh, yet another thing is we only see the mother's face two times in the movie. Every other time her face is blocked out or you just don't see it. Yeah, and that's that's with most of the adults in the movie. Like we don't get a lot of the other than the the people who he uh, this demon takes the shape of that's coming after her. A lot of the adults, older adults, parental figures, we we just we don't get to see them. They're always blocked out. Uh, also during this scene, Greg rubs Jay's shoulder, and Paul, who is sitting in the back seat, is quietly triggered. He he's is. Not, he's not liking it. Yeah. So it turns out Hugh Jeff lives in a pretty dope ass neighborhood. They pull up to this house where they see Hugh Jeff's car in the driveway and ring the doorbell. Did you notice when Hugh, Hugh Jeff's mom answers the door, Jay looks at her kind of weird, kind of a weird interaction when she first opens the door? No. Okay. Well, the reason that it's weird is because. When she first got infected with the curse thing or whatever, and Jeff had her tied to the wheelchair, and he shows her the naked lady that's coming after them, it was in the form of mm-hmm. Jeff's mom. And this is Jeff, or Jeff. Jeff, this is Jay recognizing her. And he was there, too. Yeah. Uh, that was his mom coming after them. Yeah, it's wild. And not a bad looking woman, I'll no. say that. Uh, So Hugh, Jeff, Greg, Yara, Paul, Kelly, and Jay are all sitting in his backyard as he explains all of what he knows about the curse, which isn't much. He claims that even though he has passed it to Jay, he can still see it and it's, he is still in danger. And that if it manages to kill her, the curse reverts back to him again. He also claims that he met a girl at a bar and had a one-night stand, and that is how it was passed to him. 
Greg thinks that this is all bullshit and that Hugh Jeff is just doing this to fuck with Jay. So they all hop back into Greg's car and head to a lake house Greg's family owns far away from the city. So Greg says that his dad used to take him hunting here and it's not that great. That shit is bigger than the regu- our regular house. Yeah. It's a big fucking house. Yeah, it's it's definitely nice. Yeah, and he's like, it's not that great. Are you kidding me? He's just, like, cynical. Yeah. He's just one of those cynical people. He didn't have a great childhood. Apparently. After everyone is settled in at the lake house, we see Greg pull out a metal box containing a gun, where he then sets up some targets and teaches Jay how to shoot it. So later on, we see the group just sitting around on the beach, which is weird because like no one is talking. They're kind of just hanging out. We then get a shot of Jay just sitting there thinking to herself when we then suddenly see a woman dressed in white walking towards her from far away. I love this scene because everyone's like so casual. And this woman who we see when she gets closer because we see her from far back. She's taken the form of Yara and it's getting closer and closer and like, you know, no one has seen her yet. No one is like, well, obviously she's invisible, but Jay has not seen her because she's coming up from behind Jay and she gets so close to getting her here. I, I, I absolutely love the cinematography in this scene from the, from the very first shot of Jay, you actually see her coming from the white back dot. of the woods, yep. Yep, slowly coming. And they kind of show you in real time her walking back through the woods and how close she comes to getting her. Yeah, that's what I was saying like earlier where you can actually watch this movie and watch, you know, mostly the background because like the stuff at the school, the first time Jay sees it, it's, you know, who Jeff's mom, this scene, like there's so many little things that go on in the background you got to pay attention to. So Kelly is attempting to get Jay to get into the water with her and Yara when suddenly Kelly sees Jay's long blonde hair stand straight up as if someone was holding it. Jay then tries to jump up but the thing is still holding a chunk of her hair. Paul then jumps up and hits it with the chair, freeing Jay. As soon as she falls to the ground, Paul just gets fucking thrown across the beach. Mankind coming in with the the steel chair. (laughs) Yeah, the the cheap aluminum chair in this case. I think it was just a cheap (laughs) fucking beach chair. Uh, You think it's cheaper than those wrestling chairs? Yeah. (laughs) (laughs) Those things like fold overhead. (laughs) Tiny ass Paul broke that chair. Yeah. So Greg is way off in the distance pissing. Another fucking scene where a guy has to go fucking 100 yards to piss. Yep, another contestant on the Will I Survive Going a Mile Away to piss in a horror movie. Uh, This Uh, is the one time that going that far away to piss actually kept you out of danger. Yeah. But he sees everyone running for this little shack on the beach and he takes off after them. Jay, Kelly, Yara, and Paul run inside and close the door with Jay grabbing the gun from the metal box. Paul lifts up his shirt showing some big red marks proving that Hugh, Jeff, and Jay aren't making it up. Jay then begins firing the gun at evil Yara missing multiple times and almost shooting Greg, who is still trying to get to the shack with the others. Finally, on the last shot, we see Jay hit Evil Yara in the neck, which drops her to the ground. As Jay watches for a moment to see if it is really dead, Evil Yara just gets back up, causing Jay to slam the door shut and lock it. Jay begins to have a breakdown when she then sees the super tall guy walk past the window of the shack and bang on the door. The bottom of the door then explodes open, where we then see Greg poke his head through, asking what is going on and claiming that nothing is out there. Greg then runs off for some reason. I have no idea what he went to do. Yeah, I thought he was like running around the back or something to come through another side door. No, no. He just, he's like, I almost got shot. This, this, yeah. this chick's crazy. Yeah, as Jay uh, crawls to the door looking for him, we see an evil, creepy-looking neighbor kid come through the hole in the door. So it is now taking the form of the little fucker that spot that lives next to her that spies on her. He, he peeped her through the hole, too, in the door yeah. before he crawled through. Yes. He's peeping Tom. Little shit. Jay then takes off through a side door and runs to the car, leaving everyone else behind. 
She doesn't make it far though, because as soon as she leaves the driveway, a truck pulls out in front of her, causing her to wreck into a cornfield, knocking her unconscious. Of course. As a, how many how many people like wreck in the first 30 seconds of taking off in a car in horror movies? Happens like often. Any, anytime somebody takes off in a, a car in a horror movie, you know they're going to wreck. Yeah. And she manages to drive into corn and knock herself out. <laughs> did did you did you see did you recognize who it turns into when she takes off out of that side door and runs for the car? I know that it turned it it went from the creepy kid to a girl, a little girl. It goes to uh, the girl from her, the beginning. Is it the girl that died in the be- the opening? That's her. Okay. Who was the little girl? Because I thought so. There's a there's a shot where where they run out of the barn and they first come around the corner. In yeah, it's the girl from the beginning. I thought the girl. I thought she turns into that in the next scene. Like it turns into like four different people. Yeah, she goes from seconds. like Yara to the tall guy to the neighbor kid to the girl from the beginning, whose name is uh, I believe her name's Annie. Hmm. I thought there was. I thought there was a girl, a a younger girl in between. The girl from the beginning and the the peeping Tom kid. And it's only one shot and it's it's literally right after the peeping Tom kid. No, I don't I don't I'll, I didn't I'll catch have to that. go back and watch it. So Jay then wakes up in the hospital with a bloody bandage on her head and a broken arm. So this next part's kinda weird. I guess Greg offered to sleep with Jay in order to pass the curse on to him. Yeah, he's 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 the, he's a hero, and he's he's yeah. such a good guy. You know what's fucked up too is after after this, he even admits later on that he he still doesn't believe her. He never believed her. Yeah, he's just he. The only reason he's involved in this is because he just wants to sleep with Jay. Yeah, that's the only reason that he's helping her or doing any of it. Yeah, I think he wants to sleep with any of these chicks, and they make it very obvious. Like oh, when yeah. they first go to that guy's house, like he's checking out. He's checking out Yara. Yeah, yeah. He's uh, he he he's he's in it for the for whatever for the. I'm surprised he's not gonna be. Hey, Paul, I'm gonna fuck. He's in it for the sex for sure. So while Jay is laying in the hospital bed, still bandaged up, Greg climbs on top of her and begins to thrust. This is such like a unattractive place and situation to to do it. Greg's such a douche I'm surprised he didn't start choking her during the sex scene. <laughs> I wonder how many nurses and doctors have walked in on people fucking. I, don't I know. bet you it happens. Oh like, I'm sure it happens. Does it happen? People bone anywhere. Yeah. I hate hospitals though man. I mean don't get me wrong if I was stuck in there do what I had to do. There's probably but... like a hospital fetish. <laughs> oh, I'm sh- there's a fetish for everything. It's a cast fetish. <laughs> Stick your cast in my ass. <laughs> <laughs> it kind of rhymes. I'm here for the stick your cash and <laughs> stick your cast in my that's ass. That's a fetish too. There's plenty. Of- <laughs> that's actually a pretty big fetish. There's yeah. plenty of <laughs> girls getting guys to shove cash in their ass. Where's the cast in the ass meat? I'm here for that. Oh, so afterwards we see Greg has returned to school where he is pretty much done with Jay for the most part. We see him flirting with these other three girls and living his life like normal. Totally not worried about creepy naked old people or super tall bald guys snapping his body parts into weird positions. Uh, He does visit her at the hospital where he tells her that he believes her but he still hasn't seen anything. He tells her, quote, I just don't think it's after me. Like, he's somehow fucking special. I, I don't, he doesn't believe her. That's yeah, good. but the, when then, he tells her there, like, if I was her, I'd be like, so, out of everybody that has went after, it's just scared of you? Like, that doesn't even make any sense. It, well, I just don't believe that he believes it. He like, doesn't, he doesn't believe, believe it. He doesn't believe it at all. But, but she but... tries to call him out about it. Like, y- y- are you just playing along? And he's like, no, but I he, believe you, but it's just not after Well, he me. has to tell her he believes her. Yeah, but, but that's such a fucking like, obvious lie. It, the very <laughs> next scene, like, he kind of insinuates that, you know, she's just having emotional trauma because she was fucked and dumped or something. 
I mean, he even, he even like says it. He's like, oh, I think something happened to her. It's just not what she's saying. Yeah, he's a fucking asshole. So he tries to visit Jay at home, but Kelly informs him that Jay doesn't want to see anyone right now, and she has pretty much stayed locked in her room since she has been back. The group can kind of tell that Greg thinks this is all bullshit and that he is using this situation just to sleep with Jay. Paul then points out that the chair he swung broke in midair, and this is where Greg finally admits that he doesn't believe in the curse. Later that night, Jay is watching Greg's house from her window, when suddenly she spots an odd looking Greg walking down the street in a white pair of long johns. Odd Greg attempts to get into the front door of his house but finds it locked. He then picks up a rock and breaks a window entering the home. I think it's ironic that someone who is as self-centered and overly confident like Greg would get killed by himself. Yeah, I think this thing's just smart, man. It knows that she lives across the street. And yeah. anybody but Greg going in that house would be weird. It's really smart, but it also breaks the window with a rock. Which it is doesn't because really it doesn't know doesn't, how to be yeah. hu- like human. It doesn't just know about keys. <laughs> yeah. It's like <laughs> it's like don't don't everybody just break windows to get in? Like how else do you get in? It's the only hole in the building I see. I mean, yeah. I mean, if you're gonna break in, break in the back. In hell, me and all the other ST demons, we we just break our windows to go into our house. So Jay then runs over there and begins banging on the door to get Greg's attention. She ends up breaking into the house, and when she makes it to the top of the steps, she now finds it has changed into Greg's mom and is banging on his bedroom door. And Greg's mom's got fake titties. A now pissed off Greg opens the door, only to find his mom with her titty hanging out, standing there in her nightgown. She immediately pounces on him, and when Jay looks into the room, this shit right here is wild. She sees Greg's mom fucking him to death. Yeah, what an awful way to die. It's so (laughs) fucking gross, too, because, like, she's, like, pouring juices from her crotch. This this, this, this mommy juices, man. And she's, like, got his arm, and, like, there's, like, liquid pouring from their arms like it's it's weird i think if anybody deserves to get fucked to death by their mom it's, it's greg. greg oh 100 yeah definitely so the evil greg's mom then disappears and we get a shot of a now lifeless greg jay immediately runs to her car where she takes off down the street with evil greg walking behind her she drives pretty far away parks by a beach and sleeps the rest of the night on the hood of the car The next morning, she returns home, and now that Greg is dead, she is back in the crosshairs of the curse. Later that afternoon, Paul shows up to talk to Jay and offers to let her pass the curse on to him. She declines, and then Paul asks why she chose Greg over him. She reveals that her and Greg casually hooked up once in high school, and he didn't seem scared of the curse. Paul then shoots his shot and attempts to kiss Jay, but... She turns her head away at the last minute. Damn, Paul. Like, she, she's done. She's done. She literally fucked the asshole across the street who she wasn't even friends with anymore before she chose you. Just give it up, man. Just give it up. You have been friend zoned. You were the only male left. She has an ST demon that she has to pass on to survive, and she still won't fuck you. Well, you know, I think, I think that, I think she did like Paul, but Paul friend zoned himself when he decided to kiss her sister. Yeah, well, yeah, behind her back. They were too. nine, though. I mean, come on, you, they were they, nine. They not, never too early. Nine get year old, nine year old boy. You're gonna take what you can get. Well, but, she obviously uh, moved on after that. Yeah, she calls him out on it. I just think he friend zoned himself, man. He ended up being just too too nice. I think she doesn't fuck him because she legitimately cares about him as a friend yeah, and doesn't want well, to see him die. <laughs> that's 100% accurate. Paul then asks Jay if she trusts him and she says yes. Then they all load up in the car and leave the house because Paul has a plan. And here we get one of my favorite shots of the film. As the gang backs out of the driveway, Jay looks up to see a butt-ass naked older man, dick out and all, standing menacingly on the roof of her house. I think this is an awesome shot. I think 
that, so that creepy. That butt-ass naked man is her grandfather. And that is in a picture on the wall could earlier be. in the movie. 100% could be. Yeah. yeah. I'm, I'm almost 99% sure that it is the same old man in the picture on the wall that they show. They show a bunch of pictures, family pictures on the wall. Yeah. Her grandparents is in there, and that is her fucking probably dead grandfather with his dick out on the roof staring her down. It's so such, how fucking scary. It's such a scary shot, though. And I think one of the things that makes it scary is it's it's daytime and naked old people. That's always like that's yeah, we talked about that. I mean, horror that goes all the way back to when we were talking about the visit, like yeah, just the shining the visit. Yeah. It's been in a bunch of movies we've actually. I never yeah. realized how often they used old naked people to scare <laughs> the fuck out of people. X X is another one we covered. Yeah. Old old naked people are scary. This is no true. No offense to old people out there. It's just you they're they're so like together. You, you never see like an old person like a young person, you he might be like fucked up on alcohol or drugs and he may be running well, naked down the street, but you don't ever see like a seventy year old. You doing also that. see young naked people in in movies all the time and Apparently Porn- we see pornography, naked old people in movies all the time, like half naked like models and stuff. It's very common to see a younger naked body somewhere in media, but to see an old like an old ass like somebody who would be your grandfather or your grandma naked, it just it's just weird because it never happens. It's creepy. Uh, so the group then heads to a mostly abandoned neighborhood where the public city pool still sits in working condition. Dude, this is a fucking beautiful building for a pool. <laughs> it's looks a like building. it's like gothic looking. It looks awesome. It's a cool building. And I mean, like it's a fucking pool. Why would you build this awesome gothic building? It looks like a gothic courthouse. They should have just put just red dye in the pool. Just been like blood red pool inside of this goth. It's the goth pool. There is a trend now where people are painting the bottoms of their pools like red and black now. It is, that is cool. I've yeah. seen some pictures of that. If I ever have a pool, it's going to be painted red for sure. But yeah, this this is like a, it's like a legit Olympic swimming pool though. Like you, they do races. They do like diving, probably fucking water polo or something there. They do all, all the pool sports. I don't know all the pool sports, pool but they sport. do them all there. You can tell. Uh, so we then start to see the group open up these suitcases, which contain all of these different appliances, like mixers, toasters, hair dryers, radios, TVs, just a bunch of electrical shit. They plug it all in and line each item up on the edge of the pool. I guess Jay and Kelly's mom just going to assume they got robbed. They literally took lamps and everything. Like, there's probably ain't hardly any fucking electrical appliances in their house anymore. Yeah, this is this is an awful plan. I am so there's I, a I don't reason think that this was Paul's full plan. I think I know what his plan plan was, but this is, you know, you have an Olympic sized swimming pool and a bunch of like hundred watt household electrical items. Like it's it's not like in in like the cartoons where a toaster's gonna fall in an Olympic sized pool and it's gonna kill like all the fish in the pond. So I'm glad you picked up on that because it's it's awful on purpose. So when I was reading some interviews, you know, he said that he made it a bad plan on purpose because kids, young people typically do stupid plans. <laughs> and he said that, you know, he wanted to stay away from the lot of a lot of the normal kind of horror movie plot points. And he said in like in a typical horror movie, they would like they would be some kind of clue that would lead them to a plan how to f- stop this. But he said there's no clue here. And they're just kind of spitballing and because they're younger, their plan is dumb. It is and it doesn't dumb. work. And it fails horribly, which is exactly what, you know, you know, you get a bunch of like seventeen to nineteen year olds and they're trying to stop something that no one understands. It's probably gonna be a shitty plan. Well thank God their plan was dumb too. I mean not only was the like hundred watt household appliances being pushed in a, an Olympic sized pool to kill something in the middle was a was an awful plan, but then they have her swim with all this shit plugged in as if this thing wasn't going to walk in and be like, hmm, I, well, I, I, did, I missed all the household appliances that are literally lining this pool. I yeah. mean, this thing's not dumb. 
I, been I'm, killing people for a long time. I mean, I really love the fact that they put this in there, though, because what we were talking about earlier is a lot of this movie is so much more realistic. It is. It is a lot more realistic. It's very... It, it does that better than most movies do. So as the group waits, Jay dons a swimming suit and enters the water. It seems like everyone is waiting for a long time when finally the creature, the curse, I don't know what they really call it, the it, whatever it is, it finally arrives. Jay spots it and informs the others of its location because remember, Jay's the only one that can see it. Kelly asks what exactly she sees and Jay tells her that she doesn't want to tell her. Now this is really relevant if you notice some of the stuff in the background of the movie. So earlier in the movie, we see a few pictures of Jay and Kelly's dad. It's, it's like throughout the house. This, this is the same place where you see the picture of, of, yeah. of naked grandpa. We also see the picture of Jay as a little girl with her dad when Paul comes up with this plan. Yeah. And it is largely believed that the reason that he isn't mentioned throughout the film and why their mom is like a depressed alcoholic is because their dad killed himself. This is backed up by the scene where the curse thing, whatever, has taken the form of their father, which we see in a photo on Jay's dresser. He looks exactly the same as he does in the photo, even though the photo was taken years earlier. This is also why Jay doesn't want to tell Kelly that he has taken the form of their dad. Yeah, yeah, no, I, I it's 100% their dad. Uh, oh, yeah. And I think 100% their dad died, whether he killed himself or died in an accident or something. Yeah, this, uh, there, that's another reason why earlier in the movie, when the cops come to, you know, talk to Jay about what happened, Greg's mom says that that family's yeah. a mess because there's, you know, always, all the, shit, going always on. shit going on. Yeah. Uh, so the evil dad then starts throwing some of the appliances into the pool, trying to kill Jay. But fortunately for her, the electronics are just like kind of shorting out or breakers or tripping or something. Fortunately for her, the, her, their plan was dumb as fuck. Stupid, yeah. He does manage to clock Jay in the head with a chair, though, leaving her dazed underwater. Paul grabs the gun and has Jay pointed out so he can shoot it. Once he fires the gun, the bullet actually hits Yara in the leg on the other side of the pole. <laughs> that's just a wild, that's a wild shot. <laughs> She shouldn't have been on our shelf, phone. Huh? Yeah. Kelly grabs a sheet and throws it over the creature, allowing Paul to finally get a good shot to the head, causing the evil dad to fall into the pool with Jay. Right as Jay goes to get out of the water, she is pulled under. Paul fires more rounds into the water, almost hitting Jay multiple times. Luckily, on the last shot, he hits the evil dad in the head again, allowing for Jay to escape. Once out of the water, we see Jay now has had this She's got like this weird bruised like handprint where the evil dad grabbed her. Notice she didn't die. Yes, she did not die. No, and that's it, where that goes can back touch to you. Hugh, which makes sense because none of the people die and they're, like they're always mangled and fucked up. And it, yeah, I think that was really good detail that they put Hugh told her that like he was told that because if you were, you know, as this got passed on. That would be the easiest way to tell somebody to survive. Like, all they got to do is touch you. Just stay away from them. Just whatever you do, get the fuck away from them. I guess it has to hump you to death. I guess that's how it kills you from what we've seen. I don't, I don't know if it has to hump you to death. I think it, I think it can kill you in any way. I, I, I mean, just, it's passed through sex, so I, it would make sense if it kills you with sex. Well, it... it, it we see most of the people are killed in a, a pretty violent way. We only see one other person killed. Yeah. Is that Greg? Is it Greg? No, it's Gre Greg gets humped to death by his mom. But yeah, that's who we get to, that's who we get to see die. Yeah, you know, the only time and, we actually see it kill and, something. But I wonder if that was like a... Just because it hated Greg? <laughs> well, because... For for what he did was really fucked up. Like it, they make it very obvious that his character is motivated only by sex with any of these girls. Like he's hitting on many girls throughout the the movie. So for him to die through sex, 
especially by your mom. That's even that's even worse. I think it was just poetic. I think Maybe. that that's how this creature was like, you know, kind of left him alone for a couple of days, and and when it did make its move, it, it killed him in a way that was poetic for him. Maybe. So Paul asks if he still see if she still sees it in the pool, and as she crawls over to look, all she can see is a giant cloud of blood. We then jump to later on where we see Paul and Jay finally doing the, the nasty. Yeah, Paul Paul scored some fucking points on that blind headshot. I give him I give him That's, some props on that too. That was a good fucking headshot for not being able to see what you're shooting at. Plus it's like it's he's basing it off of where where Jay is in the water, but but we know from actually shooting guns, it's hard to shoot something in the water because the way the light ref, like ref, is it like reflecting? Not reflecting. No, re- refracting it. is is. It's how the well, light. I guess it would be, uh, re- refracting. Yes, the light does refract. That's that's. And it, it well, it makes the image look like it's in a slightly different spot. It's yeah. It's because I thought you were talking about the bullet at first, but no, I see what you're saying. The the light does refract, and it it definitely kind of changes up. You don't see where somebody's actually at. They're slightly off. And for him to not be able to see what he was shooting at, it was it was a good shot. You know, I I could see her being like, "All right, you're un you're unfriend zone." You just you just you came, did you did something badass for once in your life. Just came off the bench, Paul. <laughs> Welcome to the game. It has nothing to do with you being the last guy left in the group. <laughs> <laughs> so Paul lays there like a limp noodle as Jay introduces him to the gentle squeeze of her vagina. We then pan up the window where we see a pretty gnarly rainstorm going on. The next day, we see Paul driving through a seedy neighborhood while eyeing some assumed sex workers. We jump to the hospital where they are visiting Yara, who, if you remember, got shot by Paul. Next, we see that it is the evening and Paul and Jay are taking a walk through the neighborhood while holding hands. And behind them, in the distance... We can see one lone person is following them, and the screen goes black. And that is the end of It Follows. So, what is your stance on the thing following them at the end of the movie? I don't think it's, I don't, I don't think it's, so I think Paul passed this on to the prostitute. The prostitutes that they drive by, I think that was Paul's plan is to get her to fuck him, and then he was just going to pass it on to a prostitute who is essentially going to probably pass it on to another person very quickly and hopefully get far enough down the line where they wouldn't have to worry about it. I think this whole movie is a metaphor for the the realization that adulthood sucks. Like, you go into adulthood, and, you know, she's 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 saying this... What's her name? Yara. Yara is what she's reading at the end. I think actually, let's see. So, so just paraphrase. It's uh, at this very moment, your soul will leave your body. The worst thing for certain is that death is for certain. And I think at the end, this thing being behind them, although he's passed it, this this demon is a metaphor for death, death itself, and. It's kind of, no matter what, like they're never going to know when it's coming. Like death, you know, you never know when you're going to die. The one thing is now, both of them has been infected, so when it does come, they'll both be able to see it. But uh, essentially, I think the demon is a metaphor for death. I think the whole situation is kind of a metaphor to, uh, you know, you lose your innocence as a child. Sex is one of the major steps into adulthood. You know, we we are we built as teenagers, young adults. We build sex up to be this big thing, and then most of the time, it's a letdown because you build it up so much. And I I know that this is a big thing with females. You know, they they obviously cherish their virginity more than males, but a lot of times, you know, that's a big step into adulthood, and. When you're a kid, you look forward to adulthood so much. And then we get here and we're like, damn, like, you know, adulthood kind of, we're just kind of waiting to die. I think that goes back to the beginning where she's talking about her dream. 
And she kind of mentions like, you know, she used to have this dream of being an adult and she looked forward to being an adult so much. And now that she's here, it's like, you know, where the fuck do we go? And so Hugh, whenever they're in the movie theater, they play that game and she has like tries to guess who he would want to be. And he picks that kid and she's kind of confused by that, but he's already been infected by this thing. And I think that's kind of a, you know, you, you, you want to be an adult so bad, but then you get there and there's, there's, it's just always a letdown, you know, being an adult kind of sucks and you're kind of just sitting around waiting for death. And I think that they show a lot of metaphors throughout this movie too, of kind of the, the just downfall of time, you know, as you get, you know, they show the city and how the city used to be like this bustling, super prosperous Detroit, and now it has fallen apart. And they show the bread, and it's like molding over time. And it's kind of a reference to now that they're adults and they've kind of hit this existential dread, that they're just kind of waiting to die, and they have no idea when it's going to come. I, I will agree with you on the metaphor stuff. I will disagree with you on the person walking behind them. And the reason why, and I watched it many times trying to figure it out, probably four or five times. So I think the proof is in the shot. So the shot, the first shot of them walking, there's no one back there. Then the next shot is them holding hands and it purposely shows also no one back there. The next shot is them walking again. And he's back there. So it appears out of nowhere. But he does look away at one point too, which is, I'm, I guess, I, I, I guess it could still be the demon. But they, normally once they, once, once the demon like sets its uh, eyes on somebody, it, it goes straight for them. It is. I, it's walking, it's walking right behind them, like right towards them. Yeah, I, I don't I don't think they set it up in a way that it either is or isn't. They, they didn't. There's uh, never been a definitive answer. Do you, do you think Paul passed it on to a prostitute? I do, but I also think that is a possibility that it got to it got to this this prostitute or whoever because remember like, you know, Hugh Jeff says later on like if you let it get you it just starts coming back down the row and everybody that and everybody that gets rid of it, they don't know when the next person dies. So they have no idea if the thing is going to come after them once the person they pass it to dies. So they're just, they're just completely caught off guard, and it's a lot easier for it to get everybody after that. I and, think, think that's a great, like, it goes back to the metaphor of being an adult. Now you're, you're, you come to the realization that this is your life, and you're, you're just waiting for death. Every day you're closer to death and you have no idea when it's going to come. Oh yeah. I mean, I totally agree with that. And I think another little thing that they put in there is the pool because we know that they really like water. This group of friends talks about playing in the pool when they're younger. They got the pool in their backyard. And then when you're really about to hit kind of the end of the story, we get this super random shot that the pool in the backyard is now drained. Yeah. And I, it was like that time of being an adolescent is over. Yeah, I think I agree with that. I noticed that too. And I think that's water in general. And they did it a couple of times in this movie. In the beginning, the first girl that we see die, that gets her legs snapped. She's actually sitting on the beach and you can see the water in the background. But it's, it's, it's obviously dark and... I think the water represents that joyful ignorance of a child. You know, you, you, you haven't been exposed to the world yet. And we see her in the beginning playing in the pool. Like she's, you know, she's relatively pretty happy. It's before all this shit starts happening. And I think that's, that is kind of why they ended this movie at that big pool too. Yeah. A lot of people speculate that this, this movie is really focused on STDs, but I think it's more focused on, you know, leaving your your childhood for your adulthood. The existential dread of realizing what adulthood is. Yeah, and throughout the whole movie, Yara is reading the the book, The Idiot, 
And at the very end, when they visit her, she literally talks about, you know, you realize it's days, it's hours, it's minutes. And then you finally realize it's, it's there. Yeah. And obviously that was put in there for a reason. It does. It goes hours, minutes, days. And then it says, you know, the, the worst thing for certain is that death is for certain. Like this is, this is the one thing we know we are going to die. And I think that's why the, the demon is, is the perfect example of death at the end. Cause they're going to die. Whether it's, whether this demon catches up to them or whether they die through old age, at, you know, at some point death is going to catch up to them. But the scary part is now they have no idea if it's, he's, especially if he's passed it on this prostitute, cause he doesn't know if, if they're going to be successful. Yeah, he doesn't know if the prostitute passed it on to somebody, if she got killed, and it's immediately going to come after them. I don't think Jay doesn't even know if she she might think the the shit at the end worked. But she probably doesn't even have any idea yeah. that this thing's still after them. So, you know, that's the thing about death. You know, it's one thing that's going to happen to us, and we have no idea when it's coming. And I love the ending of this movie that they left it open because you don't know. Like, are they about to to get killed or was that just a random guy? Yeah, this is one of the biggest reasons why I don't think I want a sequel to the movie. Because they really, as much as I would love to see the, the characters, I really like the characters and I would love to see them again. But will the second one have as much to say? Was well, the second one going to be in a, a prequel, kind of going back? No, no, it's it's further because she she's in it again, and obviously she's older. Like they can't, they're not going to make her younger. Is she a main character? Do you know for sure yeah. she's a main character? Yeah, she's the only cast that they've announced as she was returning, and they've talked about possibly her now trying to find out where the origin of it was. But I just don't know if they're going to have something this big and important to say. I mean, this is one of the, a, a big milestone in everyone's life. And they summed it up really well and they told the story really well. I feel like it's a, it's a possibility that the only reason that there's a sequel is to, to get a cash grab. Yeah. I mean, you know, with her being older, I, I know they can do things to make somebody look younger and it, I mean, it looked really good. I would think it would be really cool if they almost shot it in reverse from it to to get to the beginning of where it originated at or do like time jumps and maybe the movie ends with her. But if she's a main character, obviously that's not going to be the case. She was just in it at the very end and it literally ends right where this movie starts with her in the pool. Uh, that would be cool, but I don't know how they're going to go. Because she doesn't even know if this thing's still after them. You know, Paul knows that he went and fucked this prostitute, but unless he's seen it coming after him, he doesn't know for sure if the the whole thing at the pool worked either. They should know it didn't because well, they know they've it already failed. shot it in the neck. They know it failed because that's why the, the plan B was for Paul to hook up with her and then Paul to go get rid of it. That's plan B. That's do you, essentially do you, what they have do. Do you think that that was... That sh- she knew that that was plan B because I think, I think so, Paul be- had that plan, but I don't think she knew that Paul was going to go I don't, pass it on to this prostitute. I don't know for sure, but Paul's driving her car when he goes to the prostitute. So, I mean, and she's not with him. It would make sense of why she wouldn't go. So I assume. Or just Paul doesn't have a car and they're dating now. So she, he's oh. using her car. Uh yeah, I don't, I don't know. I I took that. My opinion is that she doesn't know that Paul passed it. Because they don't even say for sure that he did. They almost, they kind of leave that open too. Like he drives past them on the street, but that's that's all you see. But I think they put that in there. Obviously, it can be interpreted either way. But I think that that was their slick way. If you were paying close attention, you know, you you know, Paul took it and tried to pass it. All right, so the time frame of the movie is intentionally kept undefined so that it resembles a dream. 
Some of the cars shown are from recent times. Many appear to be from the 60s to late 80s. Early CRT television sets are shown whenever the characters are watching movies. Conflicting technology includes Yara on a device that looks like a shell compact, but she reads from it like an e-book reader and uses it as a light source at one point. Also, the girls at the beginning of the film use a cell phone and drives a modern automobile with several modern vehicles in view. See, I thought that this was a way to show like every generation goes through the same dread of going into adulthood and not being, you know, what you built it up as in your head as a kid and you become an adult and you realize being a kid was so much better. And so they they kind of didn't put a time frame on it. To, it could be any time. But also, I thought that may, would, would have made a lot of sense of why they didn't show the adults. Like, the adults almost don't have personalities anymore. They were all, like, young adults or teenagers at one point, but now they're on the other side of this, and they're just shells of their former selves. Uh, I mean, yeah, that's a, that's a good theory. I think that he, that he just wrote, if you remember, like, his whole idea of this came from his, he had kept having these recurring dreams. and. I mean, I guess you could probably take that and put it in there as well. I mean, if you if that came directly from him, then that that's probably not what his thought was, but I think that fits really well. It that's does. how it I fits took good. it. So the theater featured at the beginning of the film is the Redford Theater, a historic Japanese-style theater in the old Redford neighborhood of Detroit. And this is where the original Evil Dead premiered. Good the shit. first theater it ever played in. Which is a movie that we may or may not be covering soon. Maybe. That's a good, good one. Maybe. That's one I, I 100% have on my list as a movie to cover. I would agree. So not only do these set props prevent the viewer from placing the year, the clothing prevents the viewer from placing the time of year. Throughout this film's short duration, clothing ranges from coats, jackets, t-shirts, and swimsuits during the day to barely anything at all at night, all outdoors with no signs of discomfort. Yeah, man, this is so wild. So in the very beginning of the scene, when she's like running from what we can't see at the time, there's pumpkins on the porches, but, and then there's leaves in the, in the grass. And then she runs across street to her house and it's like summer. And then we see, you know, like they're in Michigan and supposedly in October where we seen in that one scene, but then she's swimming in pretty much nothing of a bathing suit in a pool middle of the day. And they do this a lot where they kind of change, change seasons, almost scene by scene. It's, it's crazy, but yeah, that, that kind of goes along with that. This is kind of the a dream sequence almost really interesting. And I did not notice that. You know what I noticed in that opening scene? That this lady was about to, to to break her ankles. Why in the hell would you be running in those heels? Like, if you're taking off running, just take the damn heels off. Well, yeah, I mean, that's because they did this weird time thing with the clothes, too. Like, at one point, those heels were really popular. It was, with like, the 80s. You will notice, like, even during the movie theater scene where you have all the people sitting in line, some of them are wearing complete different eras of clothing. Yeah. Yeah, I did notice that they definitely shot this where it didn't... It didn't have a specific time on it. There is a scene where it's a kind of in the beginning of the film where Kelly and Jay are walking together and Jay is in full winter outfit and Kelly is in shorts and t-shirt. So yeah, it's interesting. So the director, David Robert Mitchell, has said that neither a condom nor same gender sex would stop the monster and the curse would still be passed. There's a lot of questions when this movie came out of how to possibly prevent it. Anal. He shot that shit down. <laughs> anal. He's like, you know, anal counts too. Yeah. All right. So ratings in kill count. I wonder if a BJ counts. I feel like just any sexual with any of your main sexual parts is probably it. Yeah. I did. I did see another thing too, where he was saying that someone asked him like, well, what if you got on a plane? Would that buy you? You know, like a year for it to walk across. And he said, no, it could get on a plane and follow you. It is perfectly capable of getting on 
some kind of transportation and finding you wherever the fuck you are. So I wonder how long Hugh Jack went with this. Like, why didn't you just just do what Paul did? Like, I, you know, I'm not condoning going out and finding your, your awful looking prostitute on the street. But in this situation, especially if a BJ will pass <laughs> I don't know. I mean, that's G saves some money. Maybe he tried and it came back to him and he's like, I gotta I gotta rent a house and kidnap a girl or something. Maybe that's how he got to that point. I don't know. Well, I think I think he did I don't know if he you know, what what happened before if he tried, but I think he did want to pass this to somebody that he had at least dated, like went on some dates with, because he probably realized that this was somebody he was gonna have to tell. Like, this was somebody he was going to have to... If you do this with the prostitute, she's just going to think you're some crazy fucking... Yeah. Like, some crazy drug addict or schizophrenic or something. And you would want this to be somebody who knows that you're somewhat sane. And he even goes through the trouble of tying her down so she can see this thing coming. You You also need somebody that you can kind of keep tabs on to find out if they make it. Because that yeah. depends on whether you just get blindsided, you know. So rating and kill count. So the total kills was two. You have Annie who died somehow on the beach. And Greg who got humped to death by an evil version of his mom. My favorite kill was Annie looked good, but it was Greg for me. Fuck you, Greg. I'm glad that you died and I'm glad the way you died. Yeah, I, I agree. Mine was Greg getting... Fucked to death by a demon disguised as your mom. Like, that's just, that's, that's Solid. horrifying. Solid. All right, so rating. I rated this movie a 4.6. There is almost nothing I would change about this movie. The only thing I would change is I wish we could have seen it kill maybe the girl in the beginning. Like, at least one other kill. Just, Wish we could have seen him kill some more people for sure. Yeah, I would. I wouldn't want him to kill you know m- more than three people, because then you know I really like how the movie doesn't rely on kills to make the movie good. It relies on story and characters and sound. But if I I w- if I could see it kill the girl in the beginning and maybe one other person, I probably would have gave this a, a five star movie. Honestly. With the soundtrack, the cinematography, especially the tracking shots are phenomenal. The acting from essentially just unknown actors at the time. I mean, it has barely over a million dollar budget. It's great. I mean, it's absolutely a phenomenal movie. And it's one of those movies where we get to talk about the end. You can watch the shit in the background and see stuff you didn't know about. Those are some of our favorite movies to talk about. It's it's great. Yeah, I love anytime you can go watch a movie back and still see and pick up more and more the more you watch it. That's what worries me about the sequel. Is is the sequel going to be shot like this? Is the sequel going to have this soundtrack? Is the sequel going to have the same caliber of actors in it? Is the sequel going to have something really important to say? Well, is it going to do the weird time thing? Like, I just worry the, about that. The writer obviously put a ton of thought into this movie. Like I said, this was one of those movies where if you really track the metaphor for, for what it is, what I believe it is, with being kind of a a metaphor of the existential dread of realizing what adulthood actually is, and now your time's just ticking down, every scene really makes sense like even even small stuff like they added the uh the detroit like how it used to be this you know prosperous really bustling city and now time has has destroyed it the the moldy bread even like even something a small scene like that showing that time which which is them growing into adults you know it's it's you know it's just Everything an adult sucks. Yeah. <laughs> I gave this movie a 4.3. I agree the acting from everyone was amazing. The score, like it's very odd, but it fits the 
the movie's creepy, mundane feel thought perfectly. The metaphors to life and the dread of entering adulthood thought that was perfect. A lot of people and me, the first time seeing this, I thought this was a metaphor for STDs and the, the dangers of unprotected sex. And obviously, there's, there's, there's no obvious answer to that. It's however, you take the movie. But I think they did an amazing job at, uh, like I just said, making every scene really have a point and, and it point into a less obvious direction. The play on the most common fear everyone has, which is the fear of unknown. I mean, that was done to perfection. The characters know, literally, they know nothing about this demon or why it chooses its forms. And that's part of what makes the antagonist so scary. You know, we all have a fear of death. And the root of that is the fear of the unknown. And the the STD, the ST demon representing the certainty of death itself, I thought played into the fear of the unknown perfectly. Overall, it's it's a super original story. I thought it was geniusly written, geniusly thought out. Good movie. Yeah, it's fantastic. One last thing I forgot to mention earlier is he was he was actually talking about how Jay isn't like a final girl. And the reason why she's not a final girl is because unlike all the other final girls in the movie where everyone around them is gone and it just comes down to them and the whatever they're going against. Jay has a support team, and the only way she survives is because of this group, this support group. And this support group survives with her through the end of the movie. And I thought that was cool because he talked about not wanting to do the same thing that horror films, a lot of horror films do over and over again. And you almost don't even realize that. The whole support group took one for the team and fucked her. What What if the entire... Sequel was just she ends up pregnant and she's trying to figure out who the dad was. Oh, God, <laughs> I mean, she does like hook up, with, up three, with three guys, three guys in a week, yeah. very quick. Poor Paul, yeah. <laughs> poor Paul. It's like I'm the father. I know it. Yeah, he would raise it. I'm, I'm it. raising these kids as mine. All right, so that is our opinion on it. Follows fantastic movie. Once again, we thank you guys for listening. Please give us a follow or like if you enjoy the show. Check out the website. Check out the socials. Tell a friend, a family member, or an evil, or an evil version of an old naked guy about the show. We hope to see you next time. Fuck you, Greg. <laughs>